Well, welcome. Uh, I'd like to welcome you to your visit day here. Uh, I'm Dr David Patty and I teach at the Department of Drama and Theatre Arts. And what I'd like to do, and this will take about 20 minutes or so, is to give you a short taste of the lecture, which will, well, it'll replicate, as, I think, as far as we possibly can, the kind of information, the kind of approach that uh, you'll be encountering if you take up an offer with the University of Birmingham and with our department. Um, I'm a specialist in a number of research areas. Like a lot of members of staff, I have areas that I research in, and that feeds into my teaching. One of my main research areas is the work of Samuel Beckett, who just kind of crops up absolutely everywhere. He's not simply a, an, an icon of 20th century literature and especially 20th century drama. The images associated with his plays wind up in popular culture, they wind up in histories of dramatic form and structure, they wind up in cartoons. This is one that I pulled at random actually from a large number of potential subjects from The Observer. This is way back in 2012 and this is uh, David Cameron and George Osborne looking appropriately um, bereft at the point at which it seemed like an economic upturn in the country wasn't going to actually arrive. And what has the cartoonist done? Well he's identified them as Vladimir and Estragon from Waiting for Godot, and he has put in David Cameron's mouth the very first line of the play, nothing to be done. I think if you wanted a sign of just how far Godot and Beckett has seeped into the public consciousness, then a throwaway joke in a Sunday newspaper, or a partial mention in a programme like Buffy the Vampire Slayer, if anybody remembers that, is a good sign of just how much Godot is part of the part of the consciousness of the wider culture. Just out of interest, the line from Buffy the Vampire Slayer is, that guy's so late, he makes God all look punctual. However, I think it would be wrong to say that the seeping of the images of this play into the wider culture has actually rested on the thing that you might assume should be there which is a secure and settled idea about what this play actually means. Godot is a fascinating text and it's a text which has, I don't want to say baffled generations of scholars, but it's a text whose meaning has regularly re revealed itself as slippery, as hard to define. It's been very, very difficult, I think, for any academic, for any actor, for any director, for any cultural critic to actually fix a meaning to this elusive text. What I'm going to say, you heard about the next 50 minutes or so, is that that is not because the people who are engaged in the text are ignorant or you know, willfully missing something. It's simply because the text itself evades meaning. One of the things that's fascinating about Godot is that it's a text that seems to fall apart as the play is produced, as the play is performed. First of all, a little bit of uh, background information. Beckett writes Godot in 1947. He writes it in the middle of writing a series of novels called The Trilogy, in the middle of also writing a series of novellas gathered together in uh, a book called First Love and other, and other stories. He writes it as a kind of a relaxation in the midst of all of this torrid torrential prose. And he needs that relaxation because it's a very, very intense time in his life. He's come out of World War II where he was part of the French resistance. He's spent the last three years at the hiding from the Nazis and he's recovered from bouts of debilitating mental illness during that time 
and he's found himself now in Paris trying to make a living as a middle-aged Irish penniless would-be author who hasn't had much success in publication up to this point. But in this point in his life, texts just kind of flood out of him. And Godot itself goes extremely quickly. It's written in a very, very short space of time. The notebooks that we have for the text don't have much emendation. They don't have even many doodles. And he was an inveterate doodler. Seriously, he could doodle for Ireland, but not in the notebooks for Godot. So this play kind of floods out of him. And it seems, when the play is actually takes on its final form, it seems that the play itself is formed from a series of symbols that Beckett in his writing just seems to have to hand. These are symbols that go all the way through his writing in this period. So we have a tree in the play, which is synonymous with the other blasted heaths and uh, ruined countrysides in the novels and the short stories. We have tramps. And Beckett writes about tramps from his earliest short stories right the way through to his last substantial prose work, Worstward Ho, written just before he dies. It has characters like Potsam and Lucky who exist in a dynamic master-slave relationship. And again, there's something that runs through Beckett's work, which is very, very interested in the dynamics of power in intense relationships between his characters. It has symbols of innocence, like the boy. Little moments of fleeting innocence that seem to appear and then to disappear because the world itself really can't sustain that, that, that innocence. It has boots. Beckett's characters always have trouble with their feet. Now that can either be symbolic, you know, this is a long, tough journey that they're, that they're moving on, or it can be biographical because Beckett himself uh, had terrible problems with his feet all the way through his life. So he obviously felt this very, very intensely. He's just come from a period in his life when getting and obtaining and making sure you have enough food is something that he has had to struggle with and the whole of France has had to struggle with. So again, it runs through his writing in the period. And also, and this is something that Beckett in his writing starts to move into at this point in his career. He gets very, very interested in the way that people, I put their costuming, but it's a more general point, the way in which people perform to each other, the way in which people act out the dynamics of their relationships, act out their social status, act out their mastery or their lack of mastery in the environment and on the other characters. One of the main ways in which you can work out the power relations in Godot is to look at what the characters are wearing. And the moon. Beckett's work always seems to exist, how can I put it, in the light of eternity. The actions of the characters which seem hopeless and helpless and lost are always juxtaposed with a wider natural environment which can be cosmic in scale, which does not care for them, which does not, it's not even a question of having their best interest at heart, it's a question of not even bothering that they're there. Now, all of these symbols coming together led early critics of Godo, like uh, this is uh, Ruby Cohn one of the first American critics of Godot to posit that the play had a definite meaning. The play was unambiguously about the absence of God. All of these power relationships, all of these struggles, the hunger, the pain, the anger, all of it was played out in a universe that meant nothing. 
As Cohen says, Beckett's man, while waiting for Godot, plays a part in a tragic comedy, a slapstick part of victim in a world he did not make and that resists his efforts to make sense of it. And he, make, he can't make sense of this world because there is no authority against which he can judge his actions in terms of the play. There's nothing in this world which gives him any sense that there is, in fact, any chance of overall judgment. There's no value system against which he can judge himself. Everything is meaningless. And he is meaningless in the midst of this blank, empty universe. Critics like Cohen, in writing early in the history of Beckett criticism, this meant one thing. This meant essentially that Beckett's world was purgatorial. The early critics noted that Beckett showed a very, very early attraction for the work of Dante and of the three books of the Divine Comedy. He was especially drawn to the purgatory. And many of his characters, and that's a character called Balacqua, whose pose is one that uh, Beckett's tramps adopt in moments of rest. Characters like Balacqua in the Purgatory seem to be condemned to infinite lifetimes, not of suffering or not of salvation, but simply of waiting. And for Cohen and for early critics, Beckett's world was Purgatory without the promise of salvation. So all you could do was wait and wait and wait in a meaningless universe. Purgatory, in effect, was without end. But, that kind of easy summary actually doesn't take into account how the play actually works. It seems to suggest that the play is moving towards a definite meaning. However, when you watch the play, one of the things that happens and all the characters say this, and their actions lead you towards this conclusion, is that any sense of there being a definable meaning to this play is slowly removed from you. Every statement is undercut. Every action that seems to establish something is negated by another action which does the opposite or which simply effaces the first action. Pozzo, at the end of a rousing speech, which gives, uh, gives us a sense of his view of the world, instantly pulls it back. Gentlemen, I know, don't know what came over me. Forgive me, forget all I said. I don't remember exactly what it was, but you may be sure there wasn't a word of truth in it. And right at the heart of Act One of the play, we have a classic paradigmatic example of the way that the play offers meaning and also effaces it. And that's lucky. Pity the poor chap who has to learn all, yeah, four pages of Lucky's speech, which simply floods out of him, seeming to make no sense. In rehearsal with actors who played Lucky, Beckett said that the play, that the speech itself actually did have a kind of coherence to it. But if you looked at it carefully, it described the fate of man in a bare, bleak world, lost without the presence of a god to justify his actions. But if you can hear that signal amongst the noise of Lucky's speech, then frankly you're a better man than I am. And Beckett himself made the speech even more garbled in performance. In 1975, working with actors in the Schiller Theatre, he instructed the actor playing Lucky to deliver the speech as fast as was humanly possible, but with gestures that seemed to suggest that Lucky thought it made sense. Meaning is offered, and meaning is denied. The set offers meaning. And the meaning of the set is denied almost instantaneously. You have a tree. But is it even a tree? That looks to me more like a bush. It's a shrub. It's a bush. A, a 
What are you insinuating? That we've come to the wrong place? The state directions say a country road, a tree. So even the stage directions, if you go back to the text, seem to be lying to you. The tramps don't know if this is a tree or not. Not only do we not know whether this is a shrub, or a bush, or a tree, but it is also a botanically misbehaving shrub, or bush, or tree. One day passes apparently between the first act of Waiting for Godot and the second act. And the first and second act show entirely repeated actions. The same structure, same pattern of entrances and exits, the same type of dialogue, even though in the second half that dialogue's more difficult to sustain. But the tree's changed. The tree's got leaves. Yesterday evening it was black and bare, now it's covered in leaves. Leaves? In a single night? Must be the spring. Okay. But in a single night? I tell you, we weren't here yesterday. When the tree sprouts leaves, it not only calls into question location, but it seems to call into question the entire construction of the natural world. What kind of world is this? If trees spout leaves overnight. This doesn't play by the rules that we're used to, but what, le what rules does it play to? The play doesn't tell us. Again, it sets up something simple and complicates it. We have no certainty in the speech, we have no certainty in the natural world. We have no certainty also because the tramp simply cannot remember enough about their previous experience to be certain about who they are, where they are, and why they are in this particular location waiting for this particular person. They have no memory that they can be absolutely certain of. And because they have no memory, they have no clear sense of time. For the individual, that's all, me that's all time is. Time is the patterning of our memories in a narrative sequence. Well, the tramps don't have that, and neither does Pozzo. And we don't know if Lucky has it, because in the second act, he's dumb. In the first act, he made little sense anyway. If you live in a world with no memory, then the world you live in appears bare and bleak and infinite, and the idea of time becomes a torment. As Pozzo says in the first act, have you not done tormenting me with your accursed time? Time is here accursed, because time will not stay still. Time will not settle into memories, because the tramps and Pozzo can't hold a narrative sequence of events in their heads. So every time feels simultaneously entirely all-consuming and also impossible to place. So the natural world misbehaves, speech misbehaves, and God all misbehaves, most famously. God is the ultimate, well, I suppose these days we'd, we'd say gaslighter or troll, you know, promising something and not delivering on it. Every single day, as far as we know, the tramps return. Every single day, Godot sends an emissary, sends the boy to say that he can't come today, but he'll come tomorrow. Every single day, and the tramps wait and wait and wait and wait. And as the tramps wait, in a strange bare world that has no rules to it, talking to each other in language which has no set meaning, trapped in a world where time and memory seem to have completely disappeared, something happens to their sense of self. The fact that God was going to arrive is the only thing that they are hanging on to. 
It's the only thing that confirms that they are who they say they are, because it's the only thing that gives their lives any meaning. So when the boy says, what am I to tell Mr. Godo, sir? I tell him, tell him you saw me and that, and that you saw me. You're sure you saw me, you won't come and tell me tomorrow that you never saw me. When God can't see them because God doesn't arrive, it seems as though the tramps themselves feel as though they're on the verge of disappearing. They need somebody outside themselves to confirm their existence, to give them purpose, to give them a shape, to give them a, a sense that tomorrow will be better and different from the world that they inhabit today. God doesn't arrive. So therefore that sense of purpose, that sense of certainty, that sense of self, that sense of identity isn't confirmed. If God doesn't arrive, how do they know who they actually are? Because their only purpose is to wait for God. So what do they fall back on? What can they fall back on? What's the only thing? that can structure their lives. It's one of the things that one can say about this play, in conclusion, that it doesn't so much deliver an argument about man's place in an indifferent cosmos. It doesn't do what Ruby Cohn does with the play. It doesn't establish definite meaning that these characters are definitely in a purgatory, that the world around them is structured as a kind of an indefinite waiting room that they are trapped in. But what it does do is to show the way in which, well, if there is no meaning, if there is no point at which you're Location in the world is going to change if there is no point at which things might improve or even disimprove. And what's left to you is simply the habit of being there, simply the habit of living. And what we watch the tramps doing through the course of the play is, as Vladimir puts it, constraining themselves to beguile the hour with proceedings how shall I say, that may at first sight seem reasonable until they become habit. The characters go through the repeated actions. Vladimir shakes grit out of his hat. Estrogen checks his boots. Pots so unlucky come on, do the same things in each act and go off again. These actions might have had meaning once, but in a world without time, in a world without memory, in a world where there are no laws against which you can measure your existence, then all that you have left are the habit of the actions. All that you have left are meaningless things which do nothing more than fill the time. But those meaningless things themselves wind up being empty because habit, as Vladimir puts it in Act 2, is a great deadener. So where are we left with at the end of the play? We're left in a world which decays even as we look at it. The elements on stage have no stable meaning. Is it a tree? Is it a bush? Is it the shrub? Important parts of the symbolic system are missing. What about that ultimate power source of Godot? Well, he's not there. He's the ultimate pot so to the other characters' luckies. Well, he's absent. And he remains absent. And symbols, meaningful actions, lose meaning through a process of repetition. You do something once, they might achieve something. You do something for the 10th, 15th, 20th, 30th, 1000th time. It's just an action. It means nothing.
at the end of the play, just for a moment, Vladimir confronts this strange, decaying world in which all stable meanings are falling away. And you get the sense that just for a second he sees to the heart of it. When tomorrow comes, or I think it does, what shall I say of today? That with my friend Estrigan at this place until the fall of night, I waited for Godo. That Pozzo passed with his carrier and that he spoke to us. Probably. But in all that, what truth will there be? Just for a moment, Vladimir realizes he can fix no stable meaning to anything in this strange world in which meaning decays almost as soon as you try to grasp it. Typically, he immediately dismisses the thought. Just after the speech finishes, agitatedly, he walks back and forward across the stage saying, what have I done? What have I said? As though the decay of meaning is something that you can't look at too closely. Because otherwise, it destroys you. God of a play has proved endlessly fascinating for academics, for actors, for directors, for designers, for theatre critics. Each one of them has tried to fix a meaning to it. But in doing so, I think all they do is to draw attention to the fact that the play itself evades meaning because it shows in a world that has no ultimate guarantees, a world that has no ultimate jurisdiction, no ultimate meaning, a world without time, a world without memory, any sense of a stable meaning is going to decay. Godot, if you like, is the dramatic equivalent of sand running through your fingers. You try to grasp it, and it simply trickles away. And there's nothing that you can do about the fact that the grains of sand just keep on falling.